Uh, welcome uh, back, everyone. Um, sorry, the break was uh, a little bit short, but uh, the discussion, um, the last discussion was just so fascinating. It, it, it was a pity to uh, shorten it even further. So um, in case we have um, many new participants, uh, uh, a warm welcome and, and please look at the uh, Q&A uh, to catch up on the various things that we've discussed. So uh, what we'll now do is uh, turn our focus to um, uh, current research into uh, severe asthma and some of the advances uh, that are in, uh, in, in the pipeline. Uh, so the warm welcome to the uh, speakers uh, in, in this session. Um, uh, first, we'll uh, hear from uh, Betty Frankenmuller, uh, Stephanie Wilkinson, and Vildana Mwikic uh, 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 about severe asthma patients who are members of the uh, ELF uh, Asthma Patient Advisory Group. Um, and then Sven Eric Dahlen, uh, Professor of Asthma and Allergy at uh, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, uh, where he runs uh, a busy severe asthma service. Uh, uh, he'll uh, uh, be talking to us about uh, the research and, and, and clinical trials uh, to develop new treatments for asthma. Then uh, Dia Sulwa Singh is a severe asthma patient advocate. Um, so warm well, welcome uh, to you. Uh, and uh, uh, she's a, a leader within the Canadian Severe Asthma Network. She has an infectious enthusiasm uh, for clinical trial participation and, and, and patient for, uh, participation in, in, uh, uh, in respiratory research, which I think is, is, is critical and should be uh, uh, almost obligatory. Uh, we sh I don't know whether we will have Celeste Horsbjerg, uh, but uh, uh, in case she does come, um, she, she is uh, currently uh, the lead in SHARP, uh, and she's one of the two co-chairs, um, and uh, uh, an expert in uh, asthma has done a, a lot of uh, very fine uh, research. And, and of course, there's Olivia Fulton, uh, who's uh, my co-chair today, uh, and uh, uh, she'll, be, she'll be also uh, sharing us, with us her views. So all, once all the speakers have... Uh, uh, presented, uh, there'll be, as uh, in previous sections, there'll be time for a joint uh, question and answer session. So by all means, keep uh, uh, passing these uh, Q, uh, uh, questions into the Q&A box. So um, now uh, we'll hear from uh, Betty uh, and Stephanie and Bildana. I am Betty Frankemöhle. I'm from the Netherlands. My name's Steph. I live in the northeast of England in the UK. I have asthma all my life and in the, uh, about 30 years ago my asthma became worse. I've had asthma um, of varying severity including severe since I was four years old. That was my initial diagnosis. Yes, I uh, fortunate, fortunately had a good uh, a pulmonologist, and uh, and they under uh, they understand. But sometimes uh, I have the feeling they uh, underestimate uh, my uh, my asthma. It's only since um, kind of late teenage and early twenty years that I've been able to. Um, find um, the right description of my level of asthma and find the right treatment of me that's um, now lets me live a fairly normal life um, with some considerations. I got uh, involved from, from the beginning and I uh, like it very much because I meet uh, many nice and interesting people. I learn a lot and I uh, can develop myself. 
I have a voice that may uh, that's allowed to be heard. So I uh, I can better uh, express my opinion. Just learning more about the disease, learning about management, um, learning about uh, new treatments, uh, new treatment pathways. That allowed me to ask better questions to my um, healthcare providers. It's also I'm now a parent and um, have a one young child, um, and we are um, aware that she might have asthma. Um, one day she's still very young. Um, being part of the patient advisory groups given me. Um, it, I know that there's a support network there for when I, when and if I do need to have those conversations with other parents. Well, and I learn a lot uh, from the professionals, and that's uh, I like that. I like that, and I uh, I imagine they can learn uh, a lot from me. brilliant to do, I really enjoy doing it. I've met people from all across Europe, from different walks of life. I don't know many people who have a similar asthma story to mine, and yet um, now I do know people and we've been able to share those stories, share experiences, learn from one another, um, encourage each other, um, and learn about the healthcare systems in different countries as well. We have a respect for each other and that's uh, very important. projects that I've been working on luckily um, they've been really grateful to have the patient input I do feel like we're being listened to there's been a massive shift towards that and the highlight is just feeling like I've made a difference. I like it uh, disc uh, to discuss with the professionals I always uh, tell them uh, we uh, patients know how it feels to have a lung disease and you know how it works and, and then you put it together then you get uh, more information. A few years ago, I was able to give a lot of time. I was able to travel. I was able to attend regular meetings. And that fit brilliantly around my work. It was definitely where I wanted to spend some time. And once uh, as an ERS Congress, I run a workshop with an, uh, another patient representative. I had never uh, run a workshop before, but it was very nice. Some of the things that I've been involved in early in the project cycle, I guess, um, are now starting to have an impact on patient lives, which is brilliant. It's nice. It's nice to, uh, to be involved. And I would really recommend it to anybody who is thinking about getting involved. I've had a fantastic six years. Thank you very much, uh, Betty and, and Steph. That was that was wonderful. And uh, can I just uh, make it absolutely clear that? Uh, the experience and, and the pleasure is, is absolutely mutual. Uh, I, I think those of us on, uh, on the healthcare side uh, have really very much enjoyed uh, working with people like, like you. So um, uh, Courtney uh, from the European Lung Foundation has asked me to uh, not forget to encourage anyone uh, who's here today uh, who's interested in getting involved in asthma research to get in touch with her at the European Lung Foundation. So her contact details are somewhere in the chat. Uh, and are they visible? Okay, so it's being signaled that they are. Uh, so now I'd like to invite Sven Eric uh, to join us to talk about uh, the latest uh, research. Warm welcome, uh, Sven Eric. Thank you ever so much, uh, Ratko and uh, First of all, I really thank all the organizers behind this very stimulating event, very, very timely. And I, I think we'll have a lot of on all, all sides use for, for this. 
So I was given uh, uh, this task uh, to talk about new treatments, as Ratko alluded to. Uh, I couldn't help because of what Ratko just mentioned, all the collaborations we have had uh, in the past with patients to show as one background slide here, a painting we had. We had a competition in UBioPred where the patients uh, tried to express uh, how the disease felt. And I, I think this written, uh, drawn by a young teenager of how it feels when you have a really severe asthma attack is, is very moving and, and also very, very true, of course. So first of all, uh, there is a great commitment, I would say, among basic scientists, translational scientists, clinical scientists, uh, whether you are in, in academia or in pharma, uh, to produce new treatments for severe asthma. And uh, I think this type of presentation could be uh, could, could be quite difficult uh, and uh, end up often into s sort of a name dropping exercise where you mention all the many, many uh, candidate molecules that are being explored. Uh, not, not that's nothing wrong with that, but I, I actually choose instead to present a more high level approach uh, to, to the topic in the next 10-15 uh, minutes here. Uh, clearly, we need more treatments. And I'd just like to show some one data from an ongoing study that, that could m motivate us. I like to, uh, we talked so much today about eosinophils for natural reasons. Uh, but I, I really like to bring forward the mast cell, which actually in the 1970s, 1980s was considered as a main target for asthma treatment and has come behind. But now in research, we see more and more signs implicating the mast cell as a very key uh, disease driver and consequently an important target for uh, treatment. Continuing this high level approach, I will also talk a little more about what are the pathophysiologic mechanisms behind the symptoms uh, that we have talked about or, or other speakers have talked about a lot today. And briefly, I mentioned some completely uh, new approaches for, for treatment. And I end by, uh, which I think is appropriate uh, for all reasons, and in particular today, uh, the importance of patient involvement in, in research uh, uh, to, to find new treatments. So I always like to start with the history. And uh, as you know, uh, the history of treatment of asthma has been uh, a, a development of very broadly acting uh, therapies, uh, such as the adrenergics and uh, the breakthrough with oral steroids in the 1960s. Uh, and then this has been refined and developed and still, of course, is the, uh, the, the core treatments of asthma is the long acting uh, combination therapies, uh, which are essential uh, basic ingredients in, in, in our treatments and enough treatment for many of the mild forms. But uh, I would like to remind you that in, in the 1970s and 80s, there was also work on uh, finding more targeted uh, points for attack in the treatment. And uh, uh, with my interest in the mast cell, I can't help to mention chromoglycate, which actually is a quite interesting uh, for the uh, for, for our topic today, because chromoglycate was essentially uh, developed by a patient. Uh, Robert Altunian, an Armenian uh, physician based in the UK, had severe asthma himself. And he thought that the muscle was a good target. And he worked for a company uh, that developed many molecules. And rather than doing uh, guinea pig work, he uh, exposed himself to different drug candidates three times a week. And uh, after 
some years, it was a Heverica day when one compound worked very well, and that compound became uh, chromoglycate, which actually uh, had a fairly good anti-asthmatic effect, but, uh, but inferior to inhaled steroids. So when inhaled steroids come, it, it faded away and chromoglycate had a sh poor bioavailability also. Next were the anti-leukotrienes. One other way to uh, affect mast cell, uh, mast cells, uh, and and same can be said there. It has a clear anti-asthmatic effect, but it's inferior uh, in general to uh, inhaled steroids. And then we have uh, anti-IgE as the first uh, really biologic, and then we have the current uh, uh, biologics. So. Do we need more medications when we have so so many good ways, especially of uh, inhibiting the uh, eosinophil that is driving so many reactions? Well, I show you uh, this example from an ongoing study in Sweden called the BioCross study. It's a real life observational study of patients recruited on clinical grounds to be treated with any of the new biologics. Here you see data from the mepolizumab uh, group followed for one year. And there's one group of super responders that respond very well with improved lung function, less symptoms, greatly improved quality of life, much better asthma control. And of course, their blood eosinophils are, uh, are, are lowered considerably. Then we have the group of non-responders where actually lung function worsened, where quality of life, asthma control changed not at all, or in some cases deteriorated. However, even that group had the pharmacological effect of the anti-IgE. So what we can conclude from this is that the patients took their medications, they got rid of uh, the high eosinophil numbers, but their asthma did not improve at all. And that, of course, tells you that there are other mechanisms also involved. You heard already today about non-T2 reactions, etc., cetera, non-eosinophil asthma. And this brings me really, again, uh, on this high level uh, to the mast cell. The, the mast cell is located in the airways. It's exposed to the environment. And uh, that includes uh, allergen. It includes uh, a lot of other trigger factors uh, that can directly activate the mast cell. And the mast cell is full of bullets of potent biological molecules that can lead to the many different changes in the airways that all together lead to the airway narrowing and uh, uh, the symptoms of, of the disease. Uh, and this list is actually very incomplete that I show you, but uh, I, I just wanted to, to explain this. And we know that the mast cell is important because if we interfere with a mast cell mediator, such as, for example, the leukotrienes, which is only one of the many mast cell mediators, we can, as you can see in this graph, uh, where mild asthmatics with allergen sensitivity inhale the allergen they don't tolerate, they get an early reaction and they get a late phase uh, drop in lung function. And if you pretreat with a leukotriene antagonist, you block about half of this response, both the early phase and the late phase. And if you actually block more uh, mast cell mediators, you can protect the patient even greater uh, from the influence of allergens. And I, I wanted really to bring this up because uh, in recent years, I, my, my view is that the allergen bronchoprovocation methodology has not been used well enough because this is actually a method, the gold standard to understand mechanisms and to prove that drugs are effective in asthma. Essentially all effective treatments in asthma can inhibit one or the other aspects of an allergen challenge or for that matter challenge with other factors that can produce 
a controlled asthma attack. And this is a very safe uh, method that has been uh, developed over the years. And most recently, Paul O'Byrne and his Canadian uh, collaborative, which we are part of, uh, has refined this methodology. And there's an excellent review in ERJ about uh, uh, this method. And it continues to be useful. You have heard today about the most recent member of the biologic family in, in the treatment of, of severe asthma, anti-TSLP. The history of how anti-TSLP now is uh, a clinical treatment of severe asthma is quite interesting. It was developed for skin diseases by Amgen and it failed in clinical treatment and was redirected to resting position on the shelves and was not considered for further development. But, but then uh, Paula Burns team made an allergen bronchoprovocation study where patients were pretreated with anti-TSLP. And lo and behold, after pretreatment with anti-TSLP, both the early phase and the late phase of allergen-induced constriction in the airways was blocked, exactly as you saw on my previous slide for an anti uh, treatment. And after this, the field exploded, all the clinical development was taking place, and there are now great hopes that this new treatment really will benefit uh, patients, both with eosinophilic asthma, but as you probably have heard already, there are indications that there may be a broader uh, effect of anti-TSLP than on uh, only <coughs> eosinophils. And this happened just because the bronchoprovocation study uh, could explore the mechanism. So it's, it's very important with these mechanistic studies. If you Go down with a bronchoscope in the airways. You can look uh, at the airway in an asthmatic at stable condition. And actually, after a asthma attack evoked by a bronchoprovocation, and you can here clearly see uh, the, in, in, in with your own eyes that uh, we talk about a massive airway inflammation and an edema. And uh, we know that there's a smooth muscle constriction that, uh, as you can see, uh, restricts the airflow uh, of the tubes uh, much. And I think in order to have a high level understanding of how we try to find new asthma medications, this, this uh, picture uh, of, of the airways and an analysis of what's going on is really helpful when we try to understand the efforts to find new treatments. So to make it very simple, one can say that many different factors, not only allergen, of course, uh, well, acutely and chronically can activate the muscles, the epithelial cells and nerves. And, and these different receptive mechanisms will release different type of signaling molecules that then change the smooth muscle, make it contract, make the blood vessels dilate, have increased permeability, increase the secretion of mucus, and lead to the infiltration of eosinophils and other inflammatory cells. In addition, with repeated effects, we will have all the chronic and structural changes that have been discussed again. And we have the added influence of systemic uh, immunological and inflammatory uh, disease driving factors. But, but this type of model, I think, is, is really helping us to understand what's going on. And the search for new treatments is really that scientists try to understand better all these components in what's going on in the airways. What are the key messengers and how can we uh, interfere with this? And, and really, as actually was discussed in the previous session, I mean, uh, the triggering of the cells is, is not really pharmacotherapy. That's more avoidance, lifestyle factors, etc. But then the activity of mast cells and the release of signaling molecules is something that we really want to inhibit. But where in my mind, we still 
don't have very many very effective treatments. Uh, steroids can inhibit certain things, uh, etc., but not very potently. Uh, when it comes to the changes in the airways, yes, we have potent bronchodilators. The question is if that is enough or if we need to have more uh, mechanistic uh, antagonism also. Uh, steroids, in addition to their effect on cells, I think have an important effect in dampening the vascular reactions in the airways. And some biologics may mimic this as well. Secretion of mucus is often uh, what is found at um, autopsy stage in patients that die from asthma, uh, plug, completely plugged airways. And this is still a great unmet need. We, we well, have Eric, one, one minute left, please. We, we have hopes that, for example, uh, uh, anti IL 13 could, could be better for this, but there's much that needs to be um, improved. So from this, one can make a list of many new principles, many ways to try to improve treatment. Some of these, such as you see on the top list, the anti il 33 are already far in the clinical trials. Some things like what I have at, at the bottom here, uh, new molecules, new discoveries are at a very, very early stage, but my, view is really that uh, we have a really bright future to uh, look uh, into. There will be new biologics, there will be both biologics and small molecules targeting completely new mechanisms, and there will be new combinations, uh, not just single treatments, but you combine, for example, an anti and with a uh, biologic, and you get something that is much more in effective than any of the drugs alone. But really, in this work, I, I think this is nothing that the scientists alone, the pharma companies alone uh, do. This is something that we do together. And uh, in my mind, patient involvement is critical uh, in this development of new treatments. Traditionally, of course, as volunteers in studies, uh, but I think also uh, to participate in the conduct of studies, as we heard in, in the video before my presentation, and as I think we'll hear from Celeste now about from the SHARP project. And again, then, ELF and other uh, EFA and other, other um, organizations that uh, really uh, promote advocacy for the patients. I think uh, all, all this is essential for the development of new treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sven Erik. Uh, um, that was a, a great overview uh, in a way that I think, you know, caught, uh, people will uh, understand. And, and, and of course, uh, I think what you presented well was uh, the importance of uh, involving patients. So thank you again. Uh, uh, and, and now over to, uh, to Dia to talk about uh, her uh, experience as a research participant. Warm welcome, uh, Dia. Hi, good morning, or I guess it's afternoon for most yeah, people. It is. Unlike myself, who had a very early morning, but I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, I'm a severe asthmatic as well. Um, so great to be amongst so many of, of my people, as I would say. And I really have an infectious enthusiasm for clinical trial participation, and I'm glad to be speaking with you. Uh, I was diagnosed with severe asthma in 2010. And following, um, following sort of a, I think, somewhat suspect diagnosis in childhood, lots of the jury is still out if it was, you know, asthma at that time. But I really became interested in asthma advocacy and research um, out of necessity to improve my quality of life. So I'm going to um, just speak to you a little bit about my experience. And um, I once had a respirologist tell me that none of their patients were the same. They all had variances from each other. 
Uh, some were coffers, some were weezers, some produced sputum for my sputum people, and others didn't. Some responded to certain kinds of medications, and others responded to something else. I felt like I had tried just about everything, and I was sort of out of options. I didn't really know what to do. I was getting a lot of blank stares. And my respirologist at that time referred me uh, to a colleague in an academic research hospital in hopes of getting into a study that they were the PI of or the principal investigator of. That really began my journey into research participation. I've now participated in a few studies, uh, mostly late phase drug studies, uh, biologics in particular, and I was very happy to donate uh, leftover induced sputum for some um, future, re future research that's being done. When I became involved in research, I didn't really know what to expect other than what I was hearing from study teams or maybe I saw something on a poster. Um, I didn't have any friends at that time who had been in studies, so they were not that helpful. I had a few family members who been like, oh, I saw a commercial. And I had no idea. I wasn't even like for asthma, but they just thought that was a great benefit for me. Um, so I didn't really know, you know, what this experience was going to be look like. I just knew that I had to do something. I wanted to be an active participant. It didn't, you know, there are sort of a lot of unknowns in studies. And, you know, you can, you can get drug, you cannot get drug, you can you know, not have, you know, the positive experience that you're hoping for. So when you're looking at, you know, how do you get connected and what you're doing, like I said that I had been involved. Um, I had sort of been referred to a specific study, then my uh, specialist was actually the PI, so I was sort of connected. But, you know, there's lots of advertisements and, and things like that in terms of getting connected. The registries, which I know I've heard, from other patients sometimes, oh, I like submitted an e-form and nobody ever contacted me, or maybe you didn't meet the inclusion criteria. I promise people do look at those and they do get back to you um, if you meet the criteria or they have an upcoming study that you might be able to participate in. So I would definitely um, think it's worth connecting or staying tuned for those offered opportunities. A really important thing to note is if they don't get enough participants, things don't meet their endpoints and they, you know, studies don't work and research sort of spiral, not spirals, but at least stalls so that we need to be as patients part of that, part of that process. Um, things to consider. So study life is for sure not for everyone, but it definitely was for me. As you can tell, this photo that I have up is from my refrigerator when I had to bring many boxes of study drug home and it had to be stored in a specific spot it couldn't go in the crisper it um had other requirements that can go on the top shelf i think was the other one but you know you might just need to have room in your fridge for something there's also the time time commitment um you know if you're not a needle person and there's lots of blood draws you might need to think about whether that's a good fit but there's lots of different ways to be involved and they're not all you know drug studies or heavily regimented experiences. So there is something for everyone there. Um, one of the, I said I wasn't really sure what to expect. So there's a lot of monitoring, like it is incredibly safe. Like the safety and protocols um, are just phenomenal. Like there's, I think if you have the sniffles, you even have to like report sniffles and like it's really safe. Um, study teams are really great at um, ensuring that you know what those expectations are to do if something maybe doesn't go uh, right or you're unsure. I certainly had some late night phone calls to my study team about, is this normal or is this what's supposed to happen? Or I took it out of the box and it looks like this. So there is lots of help and support in that regard and also lots of information in, through the consenting process, which you'll do right at the beginning that will, um, give you a good sense of um, what to adapt. I think I'm running a little behind, so I'll just um, power on to the next slide. Um, there are, as I said, there's like lots of considerations you need to make about whether or not that's for you. Uh, I would also say, you know, 
time is a really big one for me. I'm not that close to my center. I'm not that far, but a two hour commute from the office and high in, you know, a high traffic time was definitely a consideration. Um, so I think it's important that you have a really good whole perspective. What I is saying is they've come a long way and there's lots of um, like home dosing and home monitoring now, monitoring now that's really much more patient focused in terms of how we can be active participants. So I will send it back to our awesome host because I know that I think I might be at the end of my time with you, but I'm happy to take questions in our Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Dia. That was that was fantastic. Uh, I, I I haven't heard in a long time such a beautiful sort of. Uh, um, you took us by the hand uh, uh, through the through the journey of a of a research volunteer. So really, thank you. There'll be there'll be questions for you, I'm sure. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, Celeste Forsberg uh, is is unable to join us, but uh, Olivia. Uh, will lead on this, and and I will join her in in the very last uh, uh, part of this uh, session, and indeed of today, where we'll talk about Sharp, the severe heterogeneous asthma research collaboration, which is now five years old. Olivia, yes, thank you, Rako. I think Courtney's going to share her screen for me with with the slides, the very rudimentary slides. I apologise for them. Um, I'll just wait. Oh, here they come. Yeah, so I, oh, fantastic. The slide's been changed. So Ratko's name's on it. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to speak to you just a little bit about uh, SHARP, the Severe Heterogeneous Asthma Research Collaboration that's patient-centred. If we move on to the, the next slide, please. As Rat. Ratko said we're now it's now five years old, which is in its so it's in its sort of second cycle of of funding. Uh, Sharp is a European Respiratory Society clinical research collaboration. But the very unique thing about Sharp compared to some of the other CRCs for short clinical research collaboration is that it has a, it has patient co chairs. So myself. Just now, and you heard from Dominique earlier in the day, who was also a patient co-chair at the start alongside uh, Ratko, who is clinical chair, and then we also have Celeste and Florence as well. Sure, it's kind of a bit unique as it brings together four different stakeholders to deliver cutting edge research because we need people from all aspects to ensure great research is done. And we're really proud that we have sort of over 200 members from 29 different countries, but we also have five pharma partners as well, who contribute in various different ways. If we could move to the next slide, please. So what's Sharp essentially trying to do is, in a nutshell, make our lives better, living with severe asthma and understanding it. But as we've seen today, severe asthma is very complex and there also is no one definition. So Sharp is aiming to develop a definition of severe asthma that will be used no matter where you are. So everyone has the same idea because currently just now, everyone thinks severe asthma is something slightly different. The key thing, as well as to end dependency on oral corticosteroids because we they have been devastating to many people and we're no longer in a position that we need to rely on them because of all the other advances that are happening and as sharp is pan-european we want everyone to be able to access severe asthma specialists because just now there is a massive inad massive difference between different countries in europe some places have very well established severe asthma centers and other places don't. But everyone who has severe asthma should be able to get the same level of treatment. We also want to be able to understand the different types to know the best treatments and also to understand if there is a way to prevent severe asthma. 
the way we are being able to do all this is each country has a severe asthma registry. So all patients with severe asthma have their data inputted into these registries. So we can share, we can do sort of huge research studies looking across Europe to see if there's similarities, differences among people with severe asthma. If we could move to the next slide, please. But for the for the importance of today, because today is all about the severe asthma patient, and to sharp patients are key. And I'm very proud to be a patient that is part of Sharp. And Betty highlighted it in her um, in the video, in her little clip, that severe asthma can only be understood better and outcomes improved if the right research is done. The right research can only be done if clinicians and academics and scientists understand what it is like to live with a condition and where the unmet need is. So this is why patients are so key to SHARP and why we are an equal member of the SHARP collaboration. If we move on to the next slide, please. So being a patient in SHARP is, it can manifest itself in a huge number of different ways. There is no sort of one specific thing you need to do and it can, things can fit in, fit your lifestyle. So for example, when I first joined SHARP, I was a member of the patient advisory group, but due to my deteriorating health and trying to keep my job, I had to step back from that. But then I was able to come back into SHARP. So it really is a really welcoming environment. I've listed just a few of the roles that you can have on the screen and also some of the activities that you can be involved in. I want to highlight a couple of a couple of the activities is that patients have had the ability to be able to bring ideas to the table and then see these ideas blossom into projects. So for example, you heard from Dominique speaking to Vanessa earlier on in the day. She spoke to a number of different people about sort of most bothersome aspects of severe asthma, and that has now become a fully fledged project. We will, in a minute, hear for in the question and answer session, we will hear from Vildana from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And she, as a patient voice, managed to sign her country up too sharp so so her country have listened to her as a patient and are now members of sharp so it shows that the voice the patient voice can do anything and everything and actually the things that you can do are endless i ran out of room on the on the on the slide which is why not everything's there um, we can actually now stop sharing um, the screen. And so what we had planned is a conversation between myself and Celeste about the vision of where Sharp sort of will, will go. So we'll sort of wing this with Ratko. And I actually think it'd be quite nice to hear from Ratko why it was that he felt patient had to be right up there at the forefront when you first sort of established Sharp? Why was it that patients had to be there? Oh, you're on mute, Ratko. Uh, it, 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 it made a lot of sense um, to have patients at the center I, I'd, I'd realize it was, it was, I guess it was part of my, my journey as a physician and as, a, as an academic researcher. I, I'd realized um, many years ago that um, uh, patients were not my patients, but that I was their doctor. So you, you've got to get your priorities right. Who's, who's serving whom? Uh, and uh, um, Often, well, most of the time, research uh, pursued a direction, followed a direction uh, um, 
which was driven by, by the investigators' curiosity, their interest, and so on, and their belief, this works, that works. Uh, and, and so there was clearly something missing. Uh, and then uh, here was an opportunity. Uh, we, we, we did a, uh, we were engaged in a, in a separate program, uh, which was driven by Asthma UK, uh, to uh, see, to reflect on what the needs would be for the future. And I thought, well, if, if we're going to do something for the future, well, let's, why don't we start a collaboration? And uh, we did a poll and everybody was very enthusiastic about it. And I thought, well, OK, so uh, why don't we just place the patient there right at the center? Uh, and that went down extremely well. Um, and I remember the first meeting we had in uh, uh, in, in Zurich, when the collaboration was founded, um, and you know people like Betty and 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 uh, Dominique were there, uh, and they'll recall uh, how much how the atmosphere was uh, electrified by the fact that we were all there, uh, all the stakeholders were there, um, and uh, you know we, we we listened to the patients, and that's what made us really focus on what it is that the patient needs. And from there, you saw the uh, the development of the mission and, and, and so on. So it was all completely patient driven. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I find since becoming becoming chair, I hadn't I knew it was patient driven. But since becoming patient co-chair, I was been even more in awe of actually just how much our voices matter and how much our voices I listened to, and it's going to be really exciting to see where where Sharp goes in the future, and some of the ideas and actually changes that it's going to make to people living with severe asthma. And I think if you were to think back to when you first started and to where you are now. Did you see it taking off quite as much, or ha has it been more than you expected? Uh, I, I'm, I'm an ambitious man, like most academics. Uh, so you could, you, 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 you. It, 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 we're never satisfied. But, uh, but what what has impressed me is the coming together of the various stakeholders. So you, you mentioned them. Uh, there is the patients, there's the their clinicians, their, their clinical teams looking after them, then there's researchers, and there's the pharmaceutical industry. And we all talk the same language. So for me, uh, that has been a culture shift. And I think to achieve any advance in any in any uh, field of life, you, you need a culture shift. People's mindset needs to change in order to get the priorities right, because they can get somehow skewed and and follow a you know a a, a, a funny direction um, so for me the the output the research output has been excellent but the critical thing has been that culture shift uh, which i think will serve us you know for many years to come yes certainly i think to to, to finish this book so i'm just aware of what the time is that definitely i go back to so Every year in Sharp, we have a sort of Sharp meeting. And in last year's meeting, I can't remember who it was, but they likened Sharp to a family because everyone is just there together for the same thing. And patients have always felt very relaxed being there. I think, I'm not sure, I'm sure Betty and Dominique would agree. And I think if anyone is wanting to sort of get involved as a patient with Sharp, please let us know because it has been so rewarding for me, not just from understanding my asthma, but also it's given me different skills, such as sort of public speaking and different opportunities, which I think people don't always realise how big an impact that has as well. So from a sharp aspect, I will sort of wrap up there about sharp and how patient-centered it is and i definitely in the next couple of 
in the next year. Well, I would do it next week if I could have a lot of ambitions to try and build a sort of patient e-platform and things so we can reach more patients across Europe in a much easier fashion than we can just now. Um, but it's a very exciting time, I think, for asthma research, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but around the world with so many patients coming together. And I think today highlights it with all the different patients we have here today. Absolutely. And, um, you know, with with, Dia, uh, with us uh, and, and Vanessa, uh, I don't know whether Vanessa is still with us, but at the sort of opposite ends of the globe, uh, this has really been a, 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 a global sort of family um, exercise. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Olivia, for that. And uh, um, so uh, uh, we, we, we now have, uh, I think we have 20 minutes for, um, for a discussion. So um, maybe if we start with Vildana um, and uh, um, Vildana, you, I've been witness to, to your enormous enthusiasm and your, your passion uh, for patients uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So can you tell us where that energy comes from? How do you keep fueling that? What is, what is the driving force in you? Well, hello, first of all, and thank you very much for this really relevant conference. And thank you, Courtney, Olivia, Professor Jukanovic and the team. It is really wonderful. And I've been enjoying from the from the morning from the from the early morning. So um, thank you for that question. And um, I am not the patient myself. I don't have severe asthma, uh, but I have a 14 year old son who has asthma. And that was the initially driving force for me to start to change something or to to make some kind of impact in Bosnia and Herzegovina because the situation here is not that good um but now uh, after that you know after this first initiative uh inner intimate initiative after that uh you know I figured it out that we need to um uh, gather here and uh I figured it out how many patients we have who are not treated, who are not diagnosed, who do not have uh, access to medication. So um, everything started with our organization in um, five years ago. Um, and now we are trying to, um, to, to move forward every day with some new initiatives or um, something like SHARP um to to put us on the map that we exist and i've been listening to professor louis who who said that uh, everyone has access to amalizumab in europe which is not the case here in bosnia so uh, those are the driving forces just to make some change and improvement in life of patients with asthma allergies and atopic dermatitis what 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 I would like to see is uh, in in, uh, in in every country as much enthusiasm as you've got in your country, um, and and that is one of the one of the missions uh, in 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 Sharp. So one of the things that um, that I think uh, we we all make an appeal to you all listening or watching this this conference is is to come together. Uh, if you have got uh, patient organizations, then and you're not a member yet, then do join. If you're a physician, a researcher, whatever else, in, in any way interested in severe asthma, then do join. There's much power in collective thinking and collective, uh, collective action. So Olivia, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the, the chat line, or rather the Q&A uh, space, and we haven't got any, anything that, uh, that is... Uh, obviously sort of sticking out as as a particular relevance to this uh this uh, session um is is there anything that you think uh, uh we could <clears throat> reflect on together uh with this uh, group of people you're muted <laughs> sorry 
sorry, I didn't mean to make that face when I was doing that. Um, I've just spotted that there's a bit about what are the aims and priorities for 2023 of SHARP. And I think from a patient chair point of view, for me, is to grow the patient representation within SHARP. Because a key thing to me that I have found is actually meeting other people with severe asthma makes you not feel as feel so lonely so yes i'm in sharp to help make a difference from the research side of things but actually also i've made so many friends not just with academics clinicians and things but also with my fellow patients so like for example with betty will often message backwards and forwards and dominique and things and that makes such a difference being able to speak to people who know exactly what it is you're going through and I've had so much, I've got so much out of it myself that I would love that for other people to experience the sort of almost the joy out of having severe asthma and the way that something good can come from it. And I don't know, Betty, if you would agree with me on that, that it's you build these friendships, but also you see really see good out of it. Yes, I. Yes, I fully agree. I uh, enjoy uh, being in Sharp, and I, uh, well, I uh, think you are, yeah, we have a, a valuable friendship built up in uh, these years, and I really uh, like it very much, and I feel much better since I am in Sharp because I learn, uh, I meet nice people, and uh, I can better cope with my uh, my asthma and my comorbidities. So that's uh, very valuable uh, for me personally. And I hope I can uh, uh, have a contribution to uh, make a better world for the severe asthma patients. Yeah, one, one, one thing, Olivia, that I value uh, when we have Betty with us in, in, in any discussion uh, is we can sometimes get carried away and start, you know, uh, talking in ac academic language uh, about this and that. Uh, and then Betty just says, oh, 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 stop, stop. What does this mean? I don't understand. Um, which means that, we're we're, that we are talking gobbledygook. Uh, we're complicating things and essentially it's telling us in a nice way, come on, you know, keep it simple, uh, you know, keep, keep focused. And, uh, and, and, and that's the way to make... Uh, progress so so betty you know we we always thoroughly enjoy and and greatly benefit from having you at all our discussions oh thank you very much and you know radko kiss with one or two s's <laughs> sorry kiss with one or two s <laughs> <laughs> okay. sorry i have to do this I got you. <laughs> so I think I've sorry, a question's come into my head, and it's just because I was thinking about sort of the takeaways from today. And I just wanted to put this to Sven Eric is and I, I I think quite a lot of people will be wondering this. Is do you think we are near to the time of when we will have good treatments for those who do not have T2 high asthma? That, that's a, a very good question. I think in the near future, there will be some progress as, as uh, clearly, uh, but the big breakthrough for, if we simplify it, non-T2 asthma uh, and new clinical treatments i don't think we're there yet i think that will probably be five years or something like that but having said that is there something we've learned from the covid um, epidemic or pandemic is that when science puts resources on things one can uh, normally vaccine took 10 years to develop now it could be done in in six months so if we could you know together raise our voice and influence and get enough funding 
on various both academic and and uh, company levels uh, there are you know potential targets that could be moved forward more quickly and this actually brings me to to uh, what I think you have discussed now, you and Ratko, for, for a short while, uh, the importance of SHARP. Uh, I mean, SHARP is a transforming activity. It's it's world unique and, and ERS should be congratulated for starting this. But to me, it's embarrassing actually that SHARP has to continue to work with such low funding uh, and and mostly contributions of people from their own goodwill. Uh, I mean, this type of activity where patients and clinicians and investigators work together should merit for, you know, major funding from, from uh, like, say, the, the European Union and things like that, and long-term funding. Because when you start new things like this, it's, it takes a long time to bond, to get together, to develop things. I mean, I, I can admit that in the beginning, I thought, sharp, this is more like a promotional, political, correct thing to start. Will it ever work? And then, you know, very clearly it works and, and it, it can be transformative. But and that leads back to your question, you know, I mean, if, if resources are put into this, I really think that there should be possibilities. And in my mind, I mean, again, to show how na narrow-minded I am, there is a lot of evidence of mast cell involvement in non-T2 asthma. And, and I think that some of the uh, potential um, new ways to inhibit mast cells could be beneficial there. And then coming back to this repurposing that I briefly alluded to, just combining already existing drugs that block mast cell mediators could have a tremendous effect and should be explored in uh, non-T2 uh, asthma, in my mind. Thank you. It comes to, to advocacy, I think. Um, uh, how, how, how does one harness all the energy and then uh, influence uh, things like funding, like support. Um, and I'd like to ask Dia and Vildana to reflect a little bit on the situation in your respective countries. So uh, Dia, how do you, how do you bring, maybe pressure is not the right word, but influence to bear on, on uh, the priorities uh, of research in, in, in Canada, and indeed, how do you how do you help your clinical researchers to uh, uh, generate the kind of funding that uh, Sven Eric is is talking about? Because big grants come from you know national funding bodies uh, such as the Canadian MRC. So, Dia, Dia, what 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 is the situation like in Canada? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think a lot of it has to do about keeping pressure on. Um, I think it's there's a lot of seen as like, oh, it's sexy year. We just came out with something, and you know that's enough. And you know, they should be quiet now for a little while. And I think one of the things, especially, I think with the I just think like biologics era or like that in the patient lens is that. Um, there are all the gaps, right? Whether it's TH low, like TH low, like there's all this un, um, sort of this need that's still there or nuances and further research and development that needs to happen. So it's about, I think, keeping the pressure on and the voice high. I would say from the patient perspective is that we know that patient um, asthma in particular sort of gets muddled or people don't think a lot about it because it's so common. And it's really bringing, I think, that in, that importance of how many people are impacted and that we can do better. And, you know, and I think that's a challenge to patients as well about, like, if, if you go home and complain about it, you don't say to anybody that this is important or this is important to me, then it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go up the food chain. Um, you know, you get researchers that are frustrated, but they're like, well, we need to do the backing of the voice and we need the patient organization to back us or we need to have a collective statement. So I think it's, 
it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think um, we're all facing, I think, national healthcare system sort of crisis situations right now that things like that are for sure on the back burner. You know, it's like keep the doors open versus like, you know, what are the patients, like, you know, the asthma peeps saying right now. So I think there, it, it is about um, keeping that lens and that pressure on, leveraging um, that patient voice, but also making sure that people know that they can speak up, that they um, can say this is important to keep that funding in play. If, if not, it won't be. It'll be on the next hot, hot ticket item, whatever it is, and on we go. Um, you know, I think it's been touched on a few times in the chat, but also that, that also has to do with the compensation side, and we all have different sort of funding agreements and how things are paid for, but that that's an important piece as well, um, because we have things that are falling off the table, right? Um, we've had, in Canada, we've had lots of changes in coverage and who's going to pay for what, especially like with Dupilumab, and then we know that people don't even have it. But you don't even have it, but you can't have it because it's too expensive. So I think that conversation is also really um, important that, that that is a need for someone and that we have to find ways to do that. So um, I think that's sort of the, the national lens that I can see. I mean, there's for sure other, other nuances on, you know, like competing for funding and other, and other things and how we tailor projects. I, I would say also having the patient voice and research design is really important. If you want people to participate, you better hear their voice of why they, like, they cannot sit somewhere for nine hours while somebody comes and takes like three blood drives, two temperature checks, and maybe gets you like a bottle of water about why that probably isn't working for participation. Like we have to be cognizant of, of that as well. So I think that's, um, sort of the national picture that I see, I think there's, uh, you know, there's some other nuances that I probably can't speak to you know, in great detail, but um, from the patient perspective or the patient org perspective, that's um, those are my thoughts. That's the thank, thank, Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Dia. Bildana, I, I, I'm familiar, thanks to you, with, with the situation in, 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 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but what can you what what share with us some some of your thoughts about how you how you went about uh, uh, making uh, uh, your country a member of of Sharp and 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 what are some of the uh, some of the challenges that you you you, you think uh, are going to uh, make the journey uh, a little bit rough? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I'll try to be as short as possible. Well, um, considering the situation with lacking of knowledge, when we talk uh, about physicians and healthcare providers here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we came to conclusion that we should bring the knowledge to uh, our physicians in order to uh, treat us better. So we uh, started uh, now international AAA Congress, which is uh, going to happen uh, at late of May this year as well. Uh, and we are bringing uh, really respectable uh, physicians here in Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, share knowledge, uh, new treatments, researches, et cetera, et cetera, to our physicians. So primary care and specialists as well. Um, later on, yeah, you were the, the guest and you were the speaker at, at our uh, third conference and we heard about SHARP and we uh, found it as a great opportunity uh, for our country and for our patients at the, at the end because we are focused on patient benefits. Um, so we asked to see if there is a possibility for some of our uh, professional organizations to apply, but since the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where we don't have a national level, let's say unique national level, everything is spread in two, two entities and uh, two, one government, but two authorities, et cetera, et cetera, and there is no unique professional um, organization of pulmonologists. Uh, we approach to you and say, we said, because we, ha we have a group of physicians who are willing to do a great job and to learn, and but the problem is that they need some kind of um, uh, um, 
professional institution or something to apply. And then um, thank, th thanking to you, you found a way um, how, how Bosnia and Herzegovina can become a part of, of SHARP where we applied uh, because uh, as a patient organization, we organize a so-called uh, professional um, a unit uh, who, who, who is willing to, to cooperate. And then we are still, you know, on the basics. We just signed the contract and now we are about to signing the contract with two clinical centers here. Uh, of course, uh, there is a pointed uh, a lead, national lead, who, who is Professor uh, Edin and um, that's it. You, you know, it, it was a little bit uh, tough at the same beginning, but now we're we're putting the uh, things in order, and hopefully Bosnia and Herzegovina can be a respectable member in a sense of giving data because we uh, so far there is a only in one part of Bosnia and Herzegovina omalizumab has just started to be uh, applied to patients so we are also uh, writing to fund uh, to funds to 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 get omaliz omalizumab i know it's 20 or more years in european market and we just you know we're fighting for for, for it to get it right now. Um, and that's our position. I don't know, I think we are. We, we would like to, to, to bridge the gap between professionals, healthcare institutions and the patients. And uh, maybe uh, when, when, we, when we see political situation here, which is always very important, you know, even in, in other countries, which are much more regulated, uh, I found, find maybe our role more uh, important here as a mediator between different parts and hopefully uh, our patients will, will be uh, treated better in, in coming years. And that is, that is the main objective of this conference, that patients are treated better, that they're happier, that they feel better in themselves. So thank, thank you very much uh, on, on, on those thoughts. So Livia, Livia we, we are, uh, I think we're just at the, uh, it's 32 minutes past. I've got a couple of slides just to, just for some, uh, Final thoughts. I'll try to share. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm technically challenged. I admit to that. Um, so bear with me whilst I set up my self. Okay. While you're setting yourself up, Ratko, I will uh, jump in quickly to say a massive uh, thank you, particularly to. Uh, Rupert and else who have been fantastic at answering the questions on the Q&A throughout the entire day. They've uh, answered sort of, what, 100, about 120 questions have been asked and they've been working away in the background. So huge thank you to them. OK. Thanks for that. We don't waste any any time. Um, uh, can you see my screen? Okay, so I kind of think of this, what, 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 what have we heard? Um, and uh, lots of questions and, 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 and from, from me as well, uh, many thanks to, to Rupert and indeed all the others who, uh, who responded. What, what I find fascinating, uh, this is a global event. So uh, thank you all for, for attending. Uh, what have we heard? Uh, we've heard that huge advances have been made in, in the treatment. Uh, and, and not just in the treatment of asthma, but all the comorbidities associated uh, with asthma. We heard the value, the necessity of multidisciplinary uh, approach to offer the very best the best expertise, the best knowledge. Uh, and, and, and this just doesn't just involve uh, physicians, this involves uh, physiotherapists, psychologists. Uh, and I think this is the, 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 for me, the main message that I heard from, from everyone uh, is that communication, 
between patient and the medical team is, is critically important. If you don't know what's in people's minds, well, you know, uh, you, you, you don't know where to go. You're lost. So it's, it's critically uh, important. And I think this is one, this is an important part of our mission. And, and this, in a way, is what uh, the European Lung Foundation does so beautifully and what you know, all organizations that patient organizations do so well is that they uh, enable the voice of the patient uh, to be heard. Uh, ideally, it should be direct, but when there's no direct way, then it should then indirect uh, in hearing indirectly via an agent is 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 helpful. So, um, for me, this is another terribly important bit: access to the best possible treatment is not just professionally responsible, but it's a question of human rights. If you cannot breathe, uh, if, you, if you lose time of work, if you cannot sleep well, if you cannot, uh, if you have to worry about how your next breath is going to be, well, you know, that is just wrong. And uh, I, I, of course you'll say, well, all diseases are such, but I think, uh, uh, if I have the choice between pain and being breathless, well, I'll take pain any time. So being breathless is, is, is really uh, an awful place to be. And uh, not only is, 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 is it a, a matter of importance that we have the best possible treatment available, but that the little delays, uh, we heard from Luciano how long it took in, uh, in, in Italy for him to get the diagnosis, how long it takes for... Uh, for patients uh, in, in a really modern society. I mean, Italy is a, is a really, uh, the healthcare system is, is deemed to be very good. Um, and we had some similar, similar surveys in Croatia and in other countries. And, and there is, for some reason, a, a delay. We're, we're sluggish. Um, so we heard from Sven Eric uh, about the patients that are being uh, developed. And there's really, I, I, I want, uh, all patients with severe asthma uh, to uh, uh, to take away from this conference that people are working really, really hard, and and a lot of money is being poured into uh, into the research and the development of of the drugs that were, uh, and I'm sure that you know sooner or later we will uh, make sufficient advances uh, to uh, to bring this uh, disease under control. Uh, and we also heard that patient engagement is is key, and not just from Dia, but from uh, a lot of people. That uh, uh, patient engagement is critical, uh, both setting the agenda, setting uh, setting the priorities, uh, asking the relevant questions. How can you help me? Uh, and of course, we are a collective of me's, and so uh, understanding what uh, what the population as a whole. Uh, needs is is critical in terms of uh, streamlining uh, development. Patient organizations, uh, which is the home for the patients in this context, uh, I shouldn't remove this word can, just say they play a major uh, role, but they're not universally uh, present. So in other words, there are countries uh, where this is highly developed, um, where, you know, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, you, you, you cannot uh, submit, let alone get approval for a grant without having patient input. Uh, they will not even consider it uh, in the, in, uh, when it comes to judging your, your grant. But this is not uh, present universally throughout the world. So those of you who are in countries where this is not developed, either at all or not sufficiently, then please uh, uh, make every effort to to, to engage, to, to bring uh, a few patients together and to start to develop a, a joined, joined up voice uh, that then represents you. And collaborations like SHARP, entities like the European Lung Foundation, I think they can make, and they do make uh, a, a big difference, uh, especially if you have several stakeholders uh, involved. And in the case of Sharp, again, I'll remind you, we've got patients, we've got their doctors, we've got uh, researchers, 
like Sven Eric Dahlen, and we've got uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And, and there uh, we come together to decide how best to uh, uh, advance the, uh, the field and how best to start uh, alleviating, really uh, fundamentally alleviating uh, uh, the suffering uh, that people with asthma have uh, sometimes on a, on a daily basis. So on that note, uh, I, I wish to thank uh, everyone. And uh, I, I guess I could spend the next five minutes going uh, person by person. Uh, I'll start with Courtney. Uh, Courtney is a, is a formidable force in the European Lung Foundation. And uh, she has uh, really by the hand taken us uh, and, and organized this uh, uh, this this conference. So, uh, uh, Courtney, you and your team are splendid. Um, and uh, then my uh, big thanks, of course, to to Olivia. Uh, Olivia is is a fantastic uh, uh, co chair. I am no longer. Uh, I, I'm stepping down as as co chair. I'm uh, the outgoing co chair. And uh, Sharp is very safe in the hands of uh, Celeste. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think you know uh, the, the the future of Sharp is uh, is uh, very very uh, solid. Uh, please continue uh, supporting it um, and continue supporting the European uh, Lung Foundation. So on that note, uh, any 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 last words uh, from you, Olivia? I think uh, just really very quickly just. Today has once again highlighted just how important research is into asthma and why the suffering of people with asthma can't continue. Because we've highlighted, people have been in the chat, have been sharing their stories. And the frightening thing is, is that everyone can relate to each other with the way that they're having to live their lives. And when I, when I attend things like this, that's what drives me on, is be almost being boosted by what needs what needs to change what we need to do to make a difference and I'm just so pleased at how today has been the number of people we've had and I guess without trying to get too emotional is this was one of the dreams of Emily and that happened so I had to and that's that's fine. Just just to for those who don't know, Emily was a member of the steering committee um, who had bad asthma, and uh, she was a delightful young lady, uh, a, a fantastic and a fighter who underwent a lung transplant uh, in, in order to uh, overcome this horrible illness. But uh, sadly, she 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 passed away not long ago, and she's still. Clearly, you very much in our memories and in, in our hearts. So, thank you for reminding us of that, uh, Olivia. That's very, very, very nice. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I guess that's it, folks. Um, we're a little bit uh, over time, uh, 15 minutes or 13 minutes. Uh, so, I hope you you've enjoyed this and and do give us uh, do give us uh, feedback uh, about this uh, this conference. This conference is for you, not for us. So if we miss something, if we misrepresented something, then let, let us know, and we'll do better next time. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you.